This is my 2024 Subaru WRX RS, and today I'll be doing an in-depth walk around for you guys. But before we get into it, I'm Sep, a car enthusiast making videos for other enthusiasts like yourselves. So feel free to subscribe to get your weekly dose of YouTube car content. You may be wondering, why is he calling it an RS? This is clearly a TR, and essentially it is a TR, but in Canada, it's called the RS trim. And there are a few differences, which I'll get into later in the video. But anyways, let's start off with the front end. The first thing you'll notice on the front end is that I got the OEM Sport Grille installed. I wasn't a fan of the standard one, and I know a lot of people will say, now your car looks like a Ford Taurus, and maybe it does, but I do like this grille much better. Now, below the grille, we can see the unpainted lower bumper. It has fake vents on either side, but it does get some cool LED fog lamps on either end. Now, moving up from the bumper, we see the headlights, and I do love these headlights. I think they're aggressive and sharp looking for this car. And these headlights have two main components. There is the main LED bulb, which is steering responsive, and the DRL, which is in this C shape. And these DRLs have a couple functions. So they stay on obviously when you're driving during the day, but also when you hit the turn signal stock, they turn yellow. So they are turning indicators as well, or hazard light indicators if you have your hazards on. Now from the headlights, we see the massive hood scoop. So this hood scoop is larger than the VA generation. It may not be as tall, but it definitely is wider. So it sucks air right into the intercooler. And I do appreciate that Subaru kept this sort of heritage piece of the WRX alive in this generation. Since we're at the front end already, let's go look under the hood. Hood struts are great. So this is Subaru's FA24 DIT. It's a 2.4 liter flat four turbocharged pushing 271 horsepower and 258 pound-feet of torque. But in terms of differences between the 2024 and the 2022 and 2023 WRXs, there isn't really much except for a larger brake master cylinder. As you can see, it just started to rain, so pardon the raindrops on the car. And also we had to move because there were deer that were getting a little too close and I got threatened, so I moved. But anyways, let's move on to the side profile of the car. And yes, let's talk about the controversial plastic cladding. They definitely aren't the greatest thing Subaru has ever put on a car, but I'm okay with it. And especially with a darker color car, there's less contrast with the actual paint color. So it's more digestible in a dark color car compared to, let's say, that bright orange that they debuted the car in. Moving on from the wheel arches, we see the 19 inch wheels Subaru put on this car. And this wheel design was actually first debuted in 2017 with the Visiv concept for the WRX. And honestly, I do think these wheels look pretty cool. Wrapping the wheels are a set of Bridgestone Potenza S007 tires, which do have fairly good wet and dry performance. Looking beyond the wheels, we see the six pot Brembo brakes in this bright red and the cross drilled rotors. In the rear, we also get Brembo brakes, but they are two pot with cross drilled rotors as well. Looking to the doors, we see the side mirror here, paint match to the body color and also LED turn signals. Here we are at the rear end and let's start off with the most controversial part, the bumper. Now, this isn't my most favorite part of the car, but at this point, I've come to just accept it. It is what it is. The bumper does get these pseudo diffusers. I don't think they're really functional, but they do look kind of cool. Now, right below the bumper, we see the quad exhaust exits. And now this car does sound pretty loud at startup and a little bit droney. Once it does warm up, the car does get pretty quiet. And honestly, I do wish it came with a little bit more sound, but that's nothing the aftermarket can't fix. Moving on to the taillights, Subaru has fallen into the lobster claw trap, which means that they have an inherent need to design their taillights in a lobster claw fashion. Now, these aren't too, too bad, although they do look like lobster claws. They are bordered in this nice black color. And also Subaru has this sort of magma inspired detailing right in the middle of the taillight, which does look pretty cool. Connecting the two taillights together is this black plastic trim piece. And at first look, it's kind of unassuming, but when you look closer, there is a very nice paint flake to it, which is a nice attention to detail that I appreciate from Subaru. Now moving up is of course the lip spoiler and the WRX has always had a short profile or a small profile spoiler compared to the STI, which always had the big wing. Opening up the trunk, we see a lot of usable cargo space. I've actually already utilized it. I have a couple storage bins there and I have my drying rags for when I wash the car. So overall, this space is really usable. Now, the one thing I don't like about the rear space is no spare tire. I would rather have one than this tire repair kit. 
And I did read somewhere that Australia spec WRXs actually get spare tires, which I'm super jealous of. Now moving on to the interior, and the first thing I want to talk about are these Recaro seats. They are completely new to Subaru. They aren't the same ones from the previous generation STI. They're finished in this black and grey two-tone colour with ultra suede inserts and red stitching. Now the seats are power adjustable on the driver's side, but manual on the passenger side. They are pretty supportive, but at the same time, they're pretty stiff. So it's good for spirited driving, but on long drives, they may feel a little bit uncomfortable. Here we are at the rear seats, and it's a nice place to be. They're finished in this two-tone black and gray color scheme, just like the front seats with the red accent stitching. And there is a lot of back seat room, especially if you have kids, you could easily fit a booster seat or a baby seat if needed. There are tether points here on both sides, and they are 60-40 split folding which means you can have extra cargo space with these folded down because you can have a pass through from the rear trunk area. Moving up to the driver's seat, let's talk about the steering wheel. It's leather wrapped and it has this nice red accent stitching. There are controls on either side of it. These controls are for your eyesight safety system and these controls are for your media and also for your phone answer and hang up. These buttons here are for your multi-function display right between the gauges, which I'll talk about later. To the right of the steering wheel, we see our controls for our windshield wipers and also beyond that we have our engine start stop button and our trip reset button. On a few occasions I actually pressed this trip reset button instead of the engine start stop button when I first wanted to start the car. If it were up to me I would have made this button a little smaller or relocated it somewhere else. To the left of the steering wheel we have our turn signal stock which for the 2024 model year went back to the normal one. So when it goes down that's for left and when it goes up that's for right and back to normal. Simple, easy, don't need to fix what's not broken. Now let's talk about the gauges and they're analog for the most part, which I do really like. I love how simple it is. I love how it's not too cluttered and it just shows the information you really need. There is a multi-function display in the middle. It shows a whole bunch of information such as your boost pressure, your fuel economy, your range. And I think this is how long you've been driving potentially or your average speed and your media, whatever you're playing. And if you have EyeSight Engage, it will show the WRX car there and it shows your distance for following and all the safety tech associated with it. So it is pretty cool. And again, I like how simple this gauge is. I love how it just shows just enough information without kind of overwhelming you or giving you sensory overload. Overall, I think Subaru hit it out of the park with these gauges. Now continuing on past our gauges, we have our dimmer control, our trunk release, and also our traction control off button. And then looking to the door, we have obviously our door handle. We have auto up down window controls for all four sides and also our mirror controls. Looking even lower, we have a map pocket and an additional cup holder. And that's mirrored on the passenger side as well. And in total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight in the middle armrest there eight cup holders in total. Moving on to the center touchscreen. There are some pros and there are some cons. So let's talk about the pros. Wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless Android Auto. And both screens are oriented in a vertical orientation just like a phone would, so that is great. Second pro, the resolution is really good. It's not an eyesore whatsoever. Now let's talk about the negatives. And the first one is the screen is pretty laggy. It's not really responsive as you can see, there's a little bit of a delay. Secondly, Apple CarPlay has crashed on me a couple times. It's not the end of the world, but it's kind of annoying when it does happen. And the last negative thing about this infotainment, which I feel is the most important, is the HVAC controls, as a lot of it is now integrated with the screen. I don't like how I have to go to a deeper menu to change a lot of my climate control. It is sort of annoying and, you know, it does keep your eyes off the road if you need to adjust it. Subaru at least did keep the manual temperature controls here and your fan speed control is pretty accessible as well as your heated seats but just having a deeper menu like that is not good for me i'd rather have a physical button for those there is physical volume knobs and two knobs which is great so at the end of the day this isn't a complete win but it's not a complete loss at the same time it's livable it does what it needs to do and it is it is nice it's kind of up to spec now with all the iPad screens taking over most modern interiors. The next thing I want to talk about is the rear view camera. So it's nothing too exciting. It has turning lines. The resolution is not the best, but it's also not the worst. There's no 360 camera. So overall, 
the rear view camera is pretty standard, nothing too exciting about it. Right below the infotainment, we have a couple charge ports. So you have your USB-C, USB-A, you have an aux port, 12 volt outlet. And there's an additional 12 volt outlet down here, which I'm currently utilizing. And there's also another USB-C and USB-A charge port for your rear passengers. Now moving to the shifter, this is the TY75 six speed and it's a pretty nice and notchy shifter. It's not the most precise one I would say, but it's pretty rewarding to shift in and out of gears. And the shift boot has this leather-like material. I don't know if it's real leather, but it has some nice red accent stitching. And that type of material is covered on each side here as well. And we have a manual e-brake, which is great that Subaru kept that, not some sort of weird flimsy electrical switch. We have a coin compartment here, coincidentally is the same shape as a DCCD controller from the VASTI. Maybe that's a foreshadowing there. We have the cup holders, which we talked about, and then this armrest. Now, Subaru kept in the tradition of having useless armrests. Now, the armrest is out of your way when you're shifting, but for me, it's not that usable. I can't really put my arm here and shift or just have a relaxing, like, you know, just having a neutral position. It doesn't really do anything. It has, again, this leather-like material with red stitching. There's minimal foam, so I know that there's an armrest extension, but the stock one here is not that great. Looking down toward my feet, you can see the pedals have this sporty aluminum finish, and the pedal placement is pretty good for heel-toe downshifts. Looking up to the rear view mirror, it's auto-dimming with a compass, home link for garage opening, and also a Starlink button here as well. And this is one difference between the TR and the RS, where this is stock for the RS trim, where for the TR, I think it is a dealer option. Looking beyond the rear view mirror, we see the camera pods for the EyeSight system. I'll do a more in-depth video about EyeSight and my thoughts on it, so stay tuned for that. Now, I wanna talk about a couple of general items about the interior, starting off with the material. Overall, the interior of this car is very nice. It feels more upscale than the VA, especially in the RS slash TR trim levels. You get this ultra suede material on the front dash, and also carried over here in the door cards. The one thing I'm not a huge fan of is this like pseudo carbon fiber wrap, which is here, here, there, and also on the rear door cards. It's not my favorite. I don't know if it's any better than piano black, but overall the interior space is nice. It's airy, the visibility is fantastic. For a daily driver, this is all you'd want. And it's sort of like a fishbowl type of interior where you can see everything, but at the same time, everyone could see inside the interior as well. That's why I got some tint done to have a little bit of privacy, but overall, this is a fantastic interior and definitely an upgrade from the previous generation WRX and STI. Anyways, friends, that concludes the walk around of my 2024 Subaru WRX RS. If you own a VB, tell me what you love about it and tell me what you don't love about it. And if you're wanting to get into one, let me know why in the comments. Anyways, friends, that's it for this video. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. I'll catch you all in the next one. Take care.